first of all i would like to thank uh, uh, our guest speaker today which is professor flip nairat i will introduce about him formally later on and uh, this program is about petal of femoral instability it is organized from uh, velamal medical college or orthopedic department and uh, it is also being uh, affiliated with the tamil nadu orthopedic association and uh, that's why we ca called it as tnya master class and i want to thank our uh, tamil nadu orthopedic association president secretary and all office bearers for giving us opportunity to do this and also our institute department for giving us opportunity to talk in this meeting so this program is totally about patello femoral instability only is a very if you know our ios theme for this year is talking on a focused topic that's why we chose this patello femoral instability it's a common condition in certain age group and less taught about in postgraduate period that's why we thought of telling this this is mainly intended for post graduates and also for practicing consultants so the event is going to be about two talks first i'll talk on just to give a overview of patello femoral instability it will be for about 10 to 15 minutes and then professor flip nairat will talk on my algorithm of management for patello femoral instability this is going to be the uh, even for the next 45 minutes to 1 hour so first i want to just give a introduction of uh, our guest speaker today lot of arthroscopy people would definitely know him professor flip nairat is uh, one of the phenomenal knee surgeon and sports injury surgeon he is based in france but uh, he has migrated to so many places and because of his popularity he has been invited in many places and uh, he was efo efo president efo means european federation of orthopedics and rheumatology and traumatology he was president during the year 2019 to 2020 and he was president for isacos during 2015 to 2017 and uh, he was president for acl study group which is a global acl study group during 2014 2016 and uh, he is attached to cac montaigne switzerland and lyon school of knee surgery in france there is a um, book written by him by the name of surgery of the knee which is mainly for the sports injury and also for all the knee conditions he has wrote written about football as medicine he has made numerous publications almost 400 to 500 publications all on peer reviewed journals so uh, it is a credit for us to have him and a privilege for him for us to have him in our meeting today it is very difficult for them to come to india but at least they are able to come to the zoom and also able to teach us we are very thankful for that so that is the our main speaker which will be in the next 15 minutes he will give a speech on his uh, his way of management of patellofemoral instability for those who do not know patellofemoral instability the masters are based in france especially philip nayer david dijor these are all from based from france and uh, they are the dictators of uh, how we manage the patellofemoral instability i am just going to give a more view of the condition for the post graduates to understand what we are going to talk about so this is from our institution patello femoral instability and uh, the incidence of this problem is about 5.8 cases per 100000 population and is common around the age of 15 to 20 so you will see people coming around this adolescent age group coming with uh, recurrent dislocation and there is highest risk of acute dislocation around the age of 10 to 17 and redislocation rate once they dislocate is somewhere around 20 to 55% so first of all before knowing about instability one should know about what is the patella stability is maintained by how it is maintained so they are maintained by static stabilizer the main stabilizer of the patella is medial patellofemoral ligament and the dynamic component of it is uh, extensor mechanism function in other way simply called as vastus medialis obliquus muscle and the osseous component is depending on the where the tibial tubercle is placed and where how the trochlear morphology is 
how the petala is positioned whether it's a petala alta it has got a high predisposition to have a petala instability how to manage petala femoral instability is first is we have to understand the anatomy and biomechanics of the stabilizers of the petala femoral mechanism so depending on the pathology the treatment has to be decided so patella if you know it it always dislocates laterally it dislocation medially is very very rare it's very very unusual but why it dislocates laterally is the factors that govern the stability of patella if you see the patella it is governed by tension between medial and lateral structures and lateral structures are inherently 10% tighter than the medial side and hence gives you a transient balance towards the lateral side so this thing is normally compensated by vmo muscle so if the vmo muscle is weak then the patella is tend to go slightly laterally and the patient start developing lateral patellofemoral joint pain and one of the common reason for anterior knee pain is vmo deficiency and you can see a lot of patients around adolescent coming around with anterior knee pain we ask them to get on vmo exercise and the pain will get better so the the reason is behind is that lateral structures are slightly 10% tighter than the medial structures and the medial structure is maintained by the vmo muscle and if the vmo muscle is very strong the anterior knee pain will also disappear so to concisely tell these lateral structures are lateral retinaculum lateral capsule patella tendon and position of tibial tubercle the medial structure is mpfl and vastus medialis obliquus so these two structures are balanced by each other if there is slightly more off tension then they will dislocate laterally this is what the basic biomechanics of the patella mechanism as you can see that if the tibial tubercle is placed laterally then they have a very high tendency to off track the patella towards lateral side so those with laterally placed tibial tubercle with extraction of tibia are already having more tension on the lateral structure and hence are at more risk of dislocating and while dislocating during the first dislocation they would invariably damage the medial patella femoral ligament because mpfl is a primary restraint and without damaging it patella cannot come out of its place unless they are ligamentously lax so be remember that the word i am telling unless they are ligamentously lax without damaging mpfl they cannot dislocate the patella so how to ascertain the lateral place tibial tubercles first is clinical assessment they will have high q angle and positive apprehension test will be positive so apprehension test will be positive which means lateral apprehension test when you try to push the patella laterally and they will feel like the patella is going to come out and the another good way of assessing is try to push it medially and see whether the symptom disappears if the symptom disappears then it means we are definitely dealing with someone with the lateral patella instability so this patient has got a uh, the best, another best way of assessing is assessing in the ot where you can the patient fully relaxed you can see that the patella gets dislocated that easily so if you just putting a lateral pressure the patella dislocates so this patient has got uh, uh, mpfl damage along with lateral placed tibial tubercle the the common thing we have to do is mri scan to assess medial patella stabilization structure and look for bone edema and it's not uncommon to see osteochondral lesion of medial patella facet and the mpfl ruptures it can not, it may not rupture the ligament all the time it may rupture oh, along with the piece of bone then you will see a medial patella facet is also damaged and ct scan is very very important to assess how laterally the tibial tubercle is placed so how it is assessed is by doing a tibial tubercle trochlear groove distance this is for post graduate very important you take ct axial cut in two places one at the highest depth of the trochlear groove another is the prominent part of the tibial tuberosity and try to superimpose both frames together and see how much the tibial tubercle is laterally placed in the trochlear groove normally it should be less than 15 mm if somebody has got around 20 mm then it is a borderline if anyone was having more than 20 mm like 22 mm 23 mm then it means the uh, tibial tubercle is placed off off place badly and the ttd distance dictates how laterally the tibial tubercle is placed so as you can see over here this patient who is based in the um, ot where is tibial tubercle is very laterally placed or plan is to bring the tibial tubercle medially so remember ligamentous laxity is a very common finding in those patients who are having a, a patella dislocation and it's not a full contraindication to do surgery so because that may be an associated factor 
it's a relative contraindication only in those patients who are having a recurrent dislocation doing a, a patella ligament reconstruction does work in those patients who are in traumatic dislocation after ligament laxity also so how can the patella be kept in the center so first thing is increase the strength of medial retainer so what we have to do is in strengthen the vmo muscle and also try to do mpfl reconstruction and offloading the deforming lateral force so which is repositioning the tibial tubercle in the normal anatomical position which means medializing the tibial tubercle while medializing tibial tubercle can also anteriorize to offload the joint so that the anterior knee pain can get improved so re realize the mpfl anatomy mpfl is not a structure which is like a stand like it is like a fan shaped structure it is positioned on the second layer of the medial aspect of the knee joint it arises between adductor tubercle and the medial epicondyle so this is the place where it's uh, originating mpfl an insertion is around superior two third of patella average length is around 60 mm as you can see here this is like a fan shaped structure it's not a single stand so when you are reconstructing remember that you have to reconstruct that fan shaped structure otherwise your patella reconstruction may not work very well so mpfl plus tto is indicated in those patients who are having more than 20 mm of tttg distance those who are having between like 14 to 20 mm or 15 to 20 mm there you can just do mpfl reconstruction without doing tibial tubercle osteotomy and uh, contra indication for doing this surgery is severe trochlear dysplasia like type d trochlear dysplasia you should not be doing mpfl tto you should be doing trochleoplasty and also you have to address the medial structure together as you can see here the mpfl reconstruction is done with two bands of tendon where you will be attached to superior to the two third of patella two tunnels over here and one tunnel over the medial epicondyle and adductor tubercle in between that there is a mpfl attachment is there you can fix the mpfl by several means you can have two anchors on the medial side or you can have a tunnel on the medial side but one tunnel on the medial epicondyle the debate always goes on the patella side because the patella can sometimes fracture when you do big tunnels so that's why the so many technologies are there where you put anchor you can put a small tunnel you can put uh, 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 one tunnel like that so that uh, you avoid fracturing the patella that is the whole idea behind so in this particular patient you make a graft through pull through a medial incision and over the patella and also the medial epicondyle you can make a passage through the subcutaneous area by through the second layer and bring it out over the isometric point so tibial tubercle osteotomy is done by shifting the tibial tubercle towards the medially and the most important you should not detach the distal attachment you have to keep the distal attachment intact and try to shift it medially for example if you have to correct 10 mm for example if this patient has got a tttg of 24 mm I have to shift 1 cm or 10 mm to make the tttg to 14 mm which will come to the normal physiological range so you have to determine you initiate it to identify how much tttg distance is and then you calculate it and displace it medially as as example as you can see that here we have displaced about 1 mm of uh, uh, 1 cm of uh, tibial tubercle towards medially and put two screws over there so that we can medially set tibial tubercle so rehab for this patient is first two weeks is rest pain relief anti inflammatory measures and ice pack etc 2 to 6 weeks hinged rom brace from 0 to 60 degrees partial weight bearing up to 6 weeks and from 6 to 10 weeks start full range of motion and full weight bearing more than 10 weeks you can do strengthening exercises outcome if indications are correct there are plenty of papers which shows the redislocation rate of the surgery is very low it is in the range of around 5 to 10% only so if the indication is correct the surgery is a very good surgery and outcomes are very satisfactory in the majority of the patient so what about the patient with trochlear abnormality is a different the totally different ball game for which we are going to expect the next 20 minutes talk from uh, professor flip nayrat he will tell more about that i just give an introduction about that those who are in trochlear that which is shallow or patella tilt along with trochlear shallowness then they are the patient who need trochlear plasty there are four types in that type a type b type c type d trochlear and type c and type d are the worst variety where there will be a severe medial down sloping so they are the one uh, which need definite trochlear plasty type a you can get away with just with mpfl reconstruction but type c and type d you have to go for trochlear plasty i'm not going to go in detail with trochlear plasty because there is going to be next talk about this more so this is the trochlear plasty where you are trying to recreate the trochlear groove 
so that we are recreating the normal anatomy in patients who are having shallow trochlea. That's what the trochleoplasty means. And complications are cartilage damage, patella incongruence, overcorrection. So just to summarize the treatment algorithm, those who are having first time dislocation, no dysplasia, no malalignment, no intraarticular, no static subluxation of patella, you can try non-operative. But those who are having second time dislocation, you definitely think about surgery, recurrent dislocators, where you have to assess the whole modalities, whether it's a ligament damage, whether there is a laterally placed tibial tubercle, whether there is trochlear abnormality, and then address the pathology correctly in the form of either doing a tibial tubercle osteotomy or MPFL reconstruction plus or minus trochleoplasty. So to summarize my talk for postgraduates, patella instability occurs due to inequality in tension between medial and lateral structures. MPFL reconstruction is a key procedure in restoring medial tension. Lateral forces can be offloaded by shifting the tibial tubercle medially and anteriorly. Trochleoplasty is reserved for those with trochlear dysplasia, especially type C and type D. And we will hear more from Professor Flip Nairet now to see how much he gives more input about uh, patellofemoral instability. Thank you very much. So I can I do a stop sentence, sir. Ah, I'll put it. Yeah. So next is, uh, if, if there are any questions, we are ready to answer at this moment. Otherwise, we'll go on to the process talk. Or we can answer all the questions uh, at the end of uh, process and talk. talk. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jay, uh, just you make it Dr. Philip Nairet uh, as a co-host. Yes, one minute. I have made one minute. Now is it possible? Uh, now is it yeah, just a minute, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Sir, now you are unmuted. Philip, okay. are you are you ready for your talk now? Yes. So I'm glad to invite uh, Professor Flip Nairet for giving his talk. Especially, he is going to tell about this algorithm of management of patients with patellofemoral instability. Professor Flip, it's all your take now. Please go ahead. Uh, are you audible? Sir, uh, I think uh, Dr. is playing uh, uh, as a video like that. Oh, it's a And uh, I work in Abu Dhabi. How do I work? Uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Flip, sir, uh, sir, uh, your uh, that audio is not clear. We are not able to hear. Yeah. God bless. Uh, Professor uh, Flip. Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, your audio is not uh, audible, sir. Your audio is not clear. Yes, but the problem is I sent you the, the, the video recorded. So I will uh, do it like this. So I, I cannot remove the sound now. So just give me a few minutes. Sure, sure.
Is it okay, like this? Do you listen to me? Do you listen? Yeah, yeah. It's okay? Ah, it's okay. So I, I, I go there, okay? In the 17th, the treatment consisted in a medial transfer of the ATT, regardless of the moral disorder, anterior knee pain, patellar dislocation, and this uh, surgery was mainly proposed in uh, females. And uh, it was what we called the uh, encephalitria. In the sixth, Sean Elionès du Genou, under the direction of Henri de Jour and Gilles Vanch, new concepts were presented and then published, and particularly the dysplasia of the trochlea, as you can see, with three types at this moment. We separate two groups of uh, patients the episodic patellar dislocation group and uh, the anterior knee pain group. In the episodic patellar dislocation group, we were able to find some predisposing factors and uh, no abnormalities in the anterior knee pain group. But uh, sometimes we can observe some patients that didn't dislocate the patella and uh, they have some uh, predisposing factor for dislocation. And it represents about 12% of the patient in a group of uh, uh, people that uh, complain about uh, on their knee pain. So these people are able or are keen to dislocate their patella, but they didn't until today. So in 1990, we published these articles where we described that uh, when a patient dislocate the patella, in 96% of cases, he has a trochlear dysplasia. And uh, in uh, many cases, more than 50%, he has uh, either a patellar alta or TTTG over 20 millimeters or a patellar tilt more than 20 degrees. This is the three principal factors we find where there is a threshold. And uh, there is also some. Uh, kind of uh, atmosphere where there is no threshold, but uh, something we find uh, very often in the group of patients that dislocate the patella, a genu recurvatum, a genu valgum, a femoral antitorsion that is excessive, but no real threshold. So it's very difficult to know if they belong to a normal population or a, a pathological population, but if you do the mean value, then you find the difference between the two groups. So we have the fundamental factor, the three main factors, and the secondary factors. And uh, there is almost uh, always, except in a few cases of real trauma, uh, some uh, factors that you can find when the patient dislocates the patella. Well, what about, you see, the physical examination. You see the, how Dan Fitian research a patella instability. And you can see the hypermobility of uh, the patella. It's uh, very similar to a Smiley test. Sometimes we can find a G sign, but uh, also uh, different abnormal trackings. And uh, let me share with you some uh, images. You see this patient with a G sign. And uh, when she extends the knee, she has the patella above the trochlea and a little bit laterally. And uh, when she flexed the knee, the patella is the center. This is a real uh, G sign. You can, uh, in this patient, see that the patella move laterally a little bit too much. And uh, when she's sitting, you can see also how she realigned when she flexed the knee. And this is still the G sign. This is very frequent. Sometimes it's different. And you see here a patient that dislocates the patella in flexion. This is an habitual dislocation. And you see this patient was already operated on when she was very young. This patient, we can suspect the patella inferior. And uh, 
an habitual dislocation. This is dif different in this patient with a permanent dislocation. You see here in my two finger of the patella is positioned laterally. And you see on the X-ray that uh, on the lateral view, you can see the patella like an AP view. So this is a very severe patellar dislocation, a permanent patellar dislocation. And also you can uh, see sometimes this kind of uh, abnormal alignment with an excessive genu recurvatum that uh, we almost never correct. This is very uncommon. You can also observe here a mal, uh, a mal torsion. You, you see here. And you see the hope the patient dislocate when he flex the knee again. You see during the extension, you reduce. It's very difficult for the patient to move his knee. You can have a true genu valgum and sometimes also this is a, a nail patellar syndrome and there is some uh, abnormalities, not only uh, at the level of uh, the knee joint with a very small patella that can be okay, but also uh, with the uh, sacrum and also the nails. This is a, a normal trochlear and uh, you recognize here the trochlear groove and uh, the two condyles like this. And uh, you observe the distance that exists between the trochlear groove and the two condyles. It means there is a very congruent uh, trochlear. When there is a trochlear dysplasia, the crossing sign is present in 96% of cases in the episodic patellar dislocation group and only in 3% in the control group. The crossing sign is uh, when the trochlear groove crosses the two condyle and above this uh, crossing, the trochlear is flat or convex. So this is why we describe the three types at the beginning of uh, trochlear dysplasia with a severe uh, type three trochlear dysplasia when uh, the crossing is very distal. The bump now is defined by the distance between the tangent to the anterior cortex and the tangent passing through the most anterior part of the trochlear group. And when uh, this uh, distance is above three millimeters, more than three millimeters, we say that the bump is abnormal. In the uh, uh, control group, this distance is minus 0 0.8 millimeters. So, uh, there is no prominence in a control group, but this is pathological above three millimeters. And this is very important for the indication of uh, trochleopathy. In fact, when there is a, a too high prominence, we can propose to correct this prominence and to create a new shape of the patella for the trochlea. And this is the deepening trochleopathy described by Henri de Jour and in this article of 1990 that we published. What about the three principal factors, the patella height, the TTTG, the patella tilt? There is threshold. So Caton and Deschamps, you can see them here in uh, the Antilles, Caribbean island, and uh, they are drinking some rum and they show the second finger, we call it uh, index in uh, France, they describe the Caton des Champs index. And uh, when uh, the ratio 80 on AP is above 1.2, we say the, there is a patella alta. And uh, the, the patella infera is defined by an index less than 0 0.6. The normal value is uh, around, uh, is between 0 0.8 and 1.2. This index is much better than the insul salvati index. And I, I can uh, give you a different example to show you that, but uh, I recommend strongly to use this one. The TTTG, it was very well described by uh, the previous speaker. And you understand uh, this is the distance uh, uh, between uh, perpendicular passing through the anterior tibial tuberosity and the perpendicular passing through 
the trochlear groove and this uh, distance uh, was initially measured on X-ray by Bernardo and Goutalier from Paris. And uh, it, uh, in fact, it uh, uh, explained the lateralization of the ATT, but also the external femoral rotation in the, in the knee joint. And uh, in 1987, we measured the TTTG and CT scan, and this is much uh, reliable. But note that uh, when there is, a, uh, for example, a, a habitual dislocation of the patella, the value of the TTTG is not so reliable because it integrates the external femoral tibial rotation, and in this case, the tibia rotate externally. Now the patellar tilt, this is a, a measure that is not always well done, as you can see on this uh, uh, cut. And uh, in fact, this is the angle by, made by uh, the line passing through the uh, tangent. The, this is the tangent to the posterior condyle. And here, not this line here, but the uh, long axis. And uh, it's uh, like this. And you see here the pattern of tilt is 28 degrees. We measure it uh, quadriceps decontracted and contracted. And uh, also there is different analysis we made in the past to show that uh, the fact it increased when uh, we uh, contracted, when the patient contracted quadriceps is uh, physiological. What, uh, whenever the, 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 the normal value is uh, below 20 degrees on a relaxed uh, quadriceps. And uh, as I told you, there is no threshold concerning the four secondary factors. And uh, of course, for example, when it's a female, it's just something we can observe, but we do not change. In 2007, with Dan Fitian from San Diego, who spent four months in uh, France, we summarized the Lyon experience in the, this article we published in the Techniques Knee Surgery. And uh, as you observe, there is the, the pink column where there is uh, no real abnormalities and uh, where we do not perform surgery. And uh, on uh, your right, uh, we can find uh, some uh, abnormalities that we try to correct. In 1996, Professor Henri de Jour retired and died two years later, unfortunately. And uh, the results of the patient operated on during this period were reported in uh, several publications, and we were very lucky uh, to have uh, the possibility to analyze the result of the surgery. In the university, uh, Henri de Jour uh, uh, took over Albert Pria. And uh, he worked uh, for several years with uh, Jean-Luc Laurent. I took over Henri de Jour, and uh, I uh, have now my successor, Elvire Servien, and uh, Sébastien Lustig working in the university, and I work uh, more now in private practice. In private, uh, Pierre Chambard, Gérard Deschamps, Michel Bonin, and David de Jour work a lot on this subject, but uh, I can say that now mainly uh, we are working uh, on this subject and uh, uh, David De Jour is the one that uh, also work a lot on this uh, subject. So in 2012, during the 15 Journée Lyonnaise du Genou, this uh, analysis was uh, revisited. And let me tell you that in uh, one year and a half in Lyon, we will have again a new uh, Journée Lyonnaise about the patella, so it means uh, 10 years after this one. So what we now propose? We propose to integrate in this uh, uh, analysis. And uh, the second point that is important is we do not consider anymore the patella tilt as a predisposing factor, but as a consequence of the patella dislocation. So about the, the MPFL, and it was well uh, presented uh, previously, so I will not uh, highlight this point. We show that uh, it seems to be important to well position the patellofemoral ligament, but even if you do not have a good positioning, 
you can still observe uh, good results and a good stabilization in most of cases. We conclude in this article that we published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine that uh, without a scopy, it's very difficult to well position the, the femoral insertion of the patellofemoral ligament. The trochlear dysplasia now, what's new for us? Since uh, the classification of uh, David Dejour, we agree that uh, uh, it's uh, better analysis with this uh, classification in four grade. In uh, grade B and uh, grade D, you can uh, see the substrochlear spur. That means there is a high prominence. So this is in this case, we want to correct the prominence. And uh, in grade C and the D, we have a double contour. A double contour means there is an hypoplasia of the medial condyle. And this is a projection of this medial condyle that uh, lead to this uh, double contour. Let me show you on the CT scan here, you have the grade A with a good trochlea, but uh, can dislocate with a flat trochlea here with a great B, and uh, you can have uh, observed this uh, subtrochlear spur that is also present in great D. And the double contour with uh, here this uh, uh, hypoplasia of the medial condyle is present in great C and D. But there is also other type of dysplasia. In the past, uh, in Seoul and uh, Houston spoke about the VMO dysplasia. There is different article and we publish several articles about uh, uh, patella dysplasia. And uh, more recently, I uh, propose to analyze the posterior femoral dysplasia. And we publish an article in uh, 2008 about the fact that uh, mm -hmm. when there is a severe uh, patellar instability, there is also an, uh, a short poster, uh, lateral posterior condyle here. So it means mm -hmm. that when the knee flex, uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, valgus that appear and uh, the patella dislocate uh, laterally. So this is the posterior lateral condyle dysplasia. Let me discuss uh, a little bit first the trochlear dysplasia, the trochleoplasty and its uh, results. Uh, David Dejour with uh, Andrew Amis highlight the, the effect of a trochleoplasty and the patella stability. They did this uh, biomechanical study in vitro in a cadaver specimen. And uh, they, they show how efficient is this uh, uh, deepening trochleoplasty. David Dejour uh, analyzed the results of uh, the trochleoplasty depending on the grade of the uh, trochlear dysplasia. And uh, in fact, the trochleoplasty performed for trochlear dysplasia type B or D, where there is a, a trochlear spur, have better outcome than the trochlear dysplasia without this supratrochlear spur. So remember, this is a good indication to perform C surgery in grade B and D. In fact, we conclude uh, for several years that uh, a good indication for a trochlear dysplasia is a severe trochlear dysplasia with a bump more than six millimeters. Also, when there is an abnormal patellar tracking, this is uh, very interesting to perform this kind of surgery. And it can be useful in a recurrent postoperative patellar dislocation. David Dejour shows in different articles that uh, the results are better if it's a primary case than a recurrent postoperative patellar dislocation case. But anyway, when you have a recurrence after a surgery, it could be very useful to consider this surgery. Trochleoplasty is often associated with other gestures. It could be a, a, a distal transfer of the ATT, or it could be a MPFL reconstruction. Uh, but note that uh, with a trochleoplasty, you can modify the TTTG so that uh, it's not so common to associate the trochleoplasty and the medialization of the ATT. To perform a trochleoplasty in case of patellofemoral osteoarthritis, is uh, still uh, uh, 
controversial. And uh, I'm not so sure there is a place to talk about it. Now, the results were reported by many teams around the world. And so this is not only the Lyon team that claimed that trochloroplastic plastic can be a, a very good surgeon. And uh, for you, I uh, prepare this uh, special part because uh, Subra, you asked me to discuss about uh, uh, trochloroplasty a little bit more. And I published this article uh, very few years ago in uh, the effort open uh, review. Uh, that is now with a very good uh, index uh, for publication. The trochlear dysplasia is uh, very well. So, oh, sorry. I have some sound. The trochlear dysplasia is very well analyzed on the lateral view. You can listen. If you follow the red line, you can see that on your left hand, there is a very full depth at 30 degrees flexion. The depth is the distance between the trochlear groove and the two condyles. On your right, you can observe a deep depth, a, a large depth at 30 degrees flexion if you follow the red line. It means at this level, the patella is well stabilized. During the surgery, one cannot also the trochlear dysplasia. Here is an example of a very severe convex trochlear dysplasia. Just some uh, general consideration. The chondral congruency is not the same than the osseous congruency. The sulcus deepens from proximal to distal. The cartilage thickness changes from proximal to distal. So, the management of uh, trochlear dysplasia. We can say that today this is very technically demanding. The results are encouraging in regards to pain and patellar stability in the short term with 80% uh, of good or excellent results. But we have still some concern about long-term results, particularly in this very young population. The first surgical technique need to know is the ALBI procedure. ALBI in 1915 described the elevation of the lateral facet in order to address the flat trochlea. But Curoda in 2002 showed very well that it significantly elevated average patellofemoral contact ratio leading to osteoarthritis. Moreover, Tigelhlar reported a very high rate of persistent patellar instability after this uh, ALBI procedure with 21% of recurrent application. He also reported a rate of 53% of uh, patellofemoral osteoarthritis rate one. This is the principle of uh, the ALBI procedure with the elevation of the anterior facet. Bone graft can be placed under this lateral facet in order to stabilize this elevation. The second method is the circus deepening trochleoplasty. Deepening trochleoplasty is logical because it reduces the flatness and the prominence. These surgical procedures are very demanding. As in 1966, succeeded the removal of the subcoral bone and to impact the articular cavity to recreate the central sulcus. Henri de Jour performed an osteotomy of both condyles to create a V-shaped trochlear. The bare technique is an 
isolated oyster conwall flap that is waved from the trochlea, and the bony surface is fashioned using bird. Was described in reported in 2006. The vibrator technique, the osteoconal flap is totally detached, placed on the table. We can work on the table and place it again in the middle. This is the technique of Henri de Jour with a deepening trochloplasty that creates a V-shaped neotrochlear groove. The, F the third technique was described by Daniel Goutalier. This is a recession trochloplasty. The aim is not to fashion a groove, but to reduce the prominent bump without modifying the patellofemoral congruence. This procedure is technically less demanding than deepening trochloplasty. It was described in 2002. Here is the principle of this uh, technique where we remove with a saw some subconral bone, but we do not change the shape of the trochlea. It's fixed by two screws. The of trochlea, trochlear density, and stabilize the pattern by your trance of the patella into the neotrochlear group. Trochleoplasty can be proposed as a primary intention. The trochleoplasty is indicated for symptomatic patient with at least one patellar dislocation and which present a severe trochlear dysplasia. Or as a salvage procedure in case of failure after previous patellar alignment surgery, and simply a T transfer. In the grade A, where there is no severe trochlear dysplasia, there is no indication for a trochloplasty. The trochloplasty is performed for trochlear dysplasia type B or D, and they have in this situation a better outcome than the trochlear dysplasia without supra transfer. Type C dysplasia want a lateral facet elevation, proximal recession wage or trochloplasty, or groove deepening trochloplasty. Although the literature is mixed and there is a lot of evidence to perform it. Some authors recommended performing both trochloplasty and MPFL reconstruction in all dysplastic knees. Eventually, associate another procedure according to the anatomical abnormalities. Note that trochloplasty allows for reducing the TTTG. What about the clinical outcomes? In the study of uh, Testa who summarized 25 clinical outcome studies at 54 months mean follow. We found an improvement concerning the apprehension test from 100% to 20% of patients. The dislocation rate was only 2% and subluxation rate was 6%. In the logo study that uh, summarized 14 some studies on trochloplasty, we found that the Pujala score will improve from four to seventy-four, and it was the case after Henri de Jour trochloplasty or Berater trochloplasty. One of the main concerns is the radiological outcomes. Present pain, but it doesn't at the progression of femoral osteoarthritis. There is no proof that surgical stabilization of the patellofemoral joint results in a long-term decrease in the development of osteoarthritis. Development of osteoarthritis may be associated with patellofemoral incongruence. 
in the deepening plasty, we recreate the V shape, but we didn't change the anatomy of the patella. Recession plasty may reduce the risk of osteoarthritis because it respects patellofemoral congruence. But the long term results should be evaluated. There is numerous complications that were reported. The trochloplasty is a very demanding surgery. Longo described 157 complications on 392 knees operated of trochloplasty, bereiter or de jour trochloplasty. Pain was increased in 11% of cases with no difference between the two techniques, bereiter or de jour. The range of motion also can be diminished after trochleoplasty. And the stiffness was observed in 2% of cases after bereiter trochleoplasty, 16% after de jour trochleoplasty. And also the, the present of osteoarthritis that we discussed previously is present according to Longo in 12% of cases and more frequent in the deepening trochloplasty described by De Jour than in the recession trochloplasty described by Goutelier or the Bereiter trochloplasty. But the trochloplasty allows for a very good control of stability of the patella. A recent systematic review working 2% of patella redislocation and 392 knees operated of trochloplasty. Goutelier trochloplasty has a redislocation rate of 10.5%, Henri de trochloplasty 3.2%, and Bereiter trochloplasty 0.8%. So, now what, about, uh, what is new about patella alta and the TTTG? We did many studies about uh, the length of the patella tendon and the anatomy of the patella. And uh, when there is a patella alta, we were able to show that uh, the patella alta is due to a torn patella tendon. And uh, you see a normal length uh, about 44, 47 millimeters. And uh, uh, in some cases, uh, we have patella tendon more than uh, 52 millimeters. And this is a threshold. We also found that the longer the patella tendon, the shorter the node of the patella. So the short node of the patella is more frequent in the episodic uh, patellar dislocation group. And this is due to this uh, study that uh, we uh, decided to associate in uh, some cases uh, tubercle distalization with a patellar tendon. Uh, sir, what happened? Are you able to hear? Yes, yes. Ah, yes, yes, yes yeah. Uh, some uh, connection breakage, I think. Eh? Yeah. Yes, sir. I think uh, the line got disrupted suddenly, isn't it? Yeah? Yes, sir. I think he is coming to the near completion of his talk. Is he still on the online? No, sir, we are not able to see Philip, sir. No, no, sir, uh, he's not there. Uh, even uh, ah, he's yeah, not sir, in sir the... Came, sir, yes, yes. 
Ah, ah, sir came again. Sir, yes. It's okay. It's okay. I am back. So, yeah, yeah. I can see you. Yeah. Come. Sorry, sorry, but you know we are a little bit uh, isolated in uh, Tahiti, and sometimes internet is not perfect, even if we have uh, the fibers. So I was saying that uh, when there is a patella alta, we can reduce functionally this uh, patella tendon, and uh, you have here an example of the surgery. We elevate the ATT with a spongious bone, and uh, we place some uh, anchors at the level of the original uh, attachment of the patellar tendon. After we distalize this uh, ATT and uh, we fix with this anchor this uh, patellar tendon. So it's not with staple, it's not too stiff. It can break if uh, uh, it's too stiff, but uh, here there is some fibrosis that makes the patellar tendon shorter and we publish excellent results with this uh, uh, technique. Also, what we found is uh, if you do not uh, correct the, pat uh, the patella alta and you just perform an uh, MPFL reconstruction, you can uh, the tunnel because there is probably too much uh, and, and finally, in some cases, have uh, valgum excessive femoral I show you we can sometimes correct it is and uh, this is a case where flexible osteotomy but this is common and here I perform a, a, a distal femoral osteotomy not that the, the alignment is not bad the knee is flexed but with a severe valgus in extension is an uh, hypoplasia part of uh, the, the... So to summarize the technique and the, of the surgical management, we always reconstruct PFL. And when TG is more than 20 millimeters for medication, when there is a path, we perform in order to get an uh, index around uh, one. And uh, this is very interesting to choose the type of surgery to analyze the lateral view I show you with the red line, you know, because when there is a, a very uh, small uh, depth of the trochlea, there is no risk to have medial impeachment. And uh, at the opposite here, when uh, you decide to distalize, if there is a good depth, you will obtain a very good congruency in front of the patella and a good stabilization. Sometimes we can combine medialization and distalization, but really to analyze the lateral view is uh, very useful. In few cases, we can propose to perform a trochloplasty. I think we discuss a lot about this uh, uh, indication. The VMOplasty now is often abandoned, but I think that in the future we will uh, again uh, discuss this technique because there is a very uh, 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 special relationship between the MPFL and uh, the fibers of the VMO and uh, uh, probably uh, it will be fashionable again to uh, uh, consider this uh, VMO dysplasia. So there is a, a place for trochleoplasty, not for every case. Uh, what due uh, to the format and uh, the other were uh, reported at long term follow up were confident technique and we can, but uh, the indication. This work is not one person, but uh, 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 a lot of surgeon that uh, Lyon and to uh, the work done by uh, Henri de Jour that uh, really. Uh, of this patellofemotability. Publish uh, many books about and the techniques and uh, in different uh, Greek, uh, uh, German, uh, Chinese, and uh, French and English. And uh, recently I uh, published a new book, The Techniques in Need. 
This is where I am located now tonight. This is in uh, Tahiti. You see this nowhere. This is uh, French Polynesia. And uh, you see, we are very close to uh, uh, Auckland that is here, about 5,000 uh, kilometers. And Chile is there, about uh, 6,000 kilometers or United States, a little bit uh, farther. So we, we are surrounded by the sea and uh, we hope always there is no too big waves. This is uh, some picture of uh, French uh, Polynesia and uh, I really hope we, we will be able to organize a, a big con right there and uh, you can join us in this uh, paradise on earth. So I want to thank you because uh, you were very patient. I'm sorry for the different technical uh, problem we encountered, but I hope that you get some ideas and uh, we can probably discuss uh, now if you want. Thank you so much. Thank you. Philip, I think you are in South Pacific Ocean, is it? Excuse me? The, the location where you are is in Pacific Ocean, huh? Yes, right this now. is the Pacific. Yes, exactly. In the middle of uh, where I show you the you yes, know, yes, yeah, yeah. Surrounded by the sea, and it's a miracle that uh, we can like oh. this, <laughs> even if we have sometimes some trouble. Mm. I just have a couple of questions for you. Can Please. I ask a couple of questions? Yes. First thing is, uh, what is the youngest age that we can operate on patella dislocators? Excuse me, what is what the what is the youngest age? I have a child with seven year old with patella dislocation, recurrent dislocation. Yes. What is the yes. youngest age that we can operate? The 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 you you, you want to say the youngest patient. Yeah, yeah. youngest patient, yeah. yeah. So I'm I am i am not a pediatric surgeon, so I uh, always try to wait for the for the end, okay, of the of the growth so that I can perform some uh, osseous gesture. Because when you perform uh, just, uh, when the patient is young and start to dislocate uh, the patel when he's a child, this is often severe abnormalities. So it's very difficult to correct that only with a soft tissue gesture. When you operate a young patient, a child, Often you have to reoperate him during the child out when he has of the of the gross plate and to perform some osseous uh, uh, gesture. Some uh, surgeons say that uh, when you place the patella in front of the trochlea, they will develop correctly, but this is not certain. Now there is uh, some controversy about that. So sometimes it's necessary to operate very young uh, child but I'm not so sure this is uh, the best uh, way to do it. Sometimes Thank you. it's better to wait. Oh, yeah. But I am not a pediatric surgeon. So I, I see more, you see the, the failure of this type of surgery than the success. But probably uh, to have the opinion of a, a pediatric surgeon would be interesting here. And one more thing is, uh, what is the role of derotation osteotomy? Femoral yes. rotation osteotomy. Yes, there is some surgeon that promote uh, fem femoral derotation osteotomy a lot, like Philip Schuttler. But I think that there is some indication, and I show you some case where it seems to be interesting. But uh, uh, in fact, I'm not so sure this is uh, very uh, well adapted. Uh, why? Because I show you that the the in fact this is that the, in the posterior part of the uh, uh, femoral uh, aspect that there is uh, an, uh, a dysplasia also. And with a femoral osteotomy, you cannot lengthen just the posterolateral part. So you rotate all the, the, the femur, but this is not exactly uh, an addition. So I that in some case, you can do that, but it's not so frequent. Not so frequent. I would not do it for patients. When I do that, I measure carefully 
with a CT scan, with a clinical examination. Uh, 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 it takes time for me to decide to do it. Every time I can avoid, I avoid to do it. But when there is a permanent dislocation, for example, I did one in Chile with my uh, colleague for a very severe uh, uh, patellar dislocation, uh, permanent actual patellar dislocation, and then we did a rotation. But this is not common. And after, you have the question, where you perform the derotation, that the upper part or a distal part? Usually at the distal part, because I am close to me, this is uh, much more than I know. But if the upper part, you can rotate through the muscle. Very is all the quadriceps. Uh, so it could be sometimes interesting. But the lack of evidence to make the good choice. Thank you. And you, and you, where do you derotate? Distal femur, you want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> because we are knee surgeon. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Philip. Uh, uh, are there any more, if there are no more questions in the chat box? We will come to conclusion then. Ramesh, are there any questions in the chat box? Check it. Not so many, no. No, yes, uh, yeah. No. Uh, no, sir, no. No, no sir, no. Uh, no, sir. No, no, no. Fine, fine. So it means you are coming to the stage of conclusion. I think it's a late evening for you, isn't it there? What time is it over there now? Now it's, uh, it's 9 or oh, 9. 9 p.m., huh? Uh, uh, yes, 9 here we go to bed at uh, 7. <laughs> yeah, I think it's time for you to go to bed then. Uh, it was a wonderful event. Thank you very much for uh, participating in our uh, webinar. And uh, it was eye-opening exactly. talk from your side. And uh, we learned a lot from you about proprioplasty because we don't do much of proprioplasty here. It was nice to hear about uh, uh, all your interesting indications and uh, surgical techniques. Thanks about it. And uh, thank you, Flip, for participating in our event. Thank you, uh, all the participants. And uh, uh, thanks uh, for Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association and uh, um, our team members and Olympic team members. Thank you very much. So with this, we conclude this event. This event can be seen in uh, YouTube or in Ortho TV also at a later stage. From maybe after two or three days, it will get live in the Ortho TV also. So, Philip, you can watch this in YouTube at the later stage also. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you Ramesh. Yeah. yeah. Have a good evening. For you, no, good day. You This is the afternoon. It's time for yes, lunch. Yes, please. yes, thank yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, have a good lunch. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For yeah. Thank you, sister. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, sir. Bye -bye, sir. Mm -hmm.